Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just uh, would like to thank you all for being here and to welcome uh, our guests, our, our, our keynote speakers and our speakers, and especially welcome and thank to the, the team that organized this conference, um, Professor Juan Calatrava and, uh, and Professor... Uh, Sorry. Uh, sorry, and David Arredondo, and especially welcome um, and thank our, our professor Marta Stella, which um, is our partner from the school in, uh, in our school. So David, Juan and Marta, uh, thank you very much. And I will just uh, now pass the microphone to Marta. Thank you very much. So I don't know if we are going to see it. Yes, you can see to say some words. So, uh, many thanks to all for uh, coming. Um, well, I would like to thank uh, especially to uh, Juan Calatrava and David Redondo again, uh, because, uh, well, it was their initiative to, um, to uh, do this uh, research pro project that has to do with the with the, with the idea, well, with food and uh, the relation of architecture with food, um, taking advantage of uh, that, that architecture can actually be part of the food revolution that I think that we all are starting to live. Um, so it is, a, I think, a very uh, interesting research project. So thank you for inviting us in the Universidade Autónoma de Lisboa for taking part of it. In fact, it's very curious, but um, in this school uh, we had already done some research in what concerns to this uh, food revolution and uh, with the idea of food from, um, from many points of view, from uh, the point of view of domestic architecture, but also in relation to the city. So, um, and mainly in the fifth year, and for example, we are going to have here uh, present uh, the work that is some kind of progression of what have been presented in this school as an AMA uh, thesis. Um, but um, actually, um, it is uh, very interesting also to see such a great audience with uh, all the researchers that make part of this project that are mainly not only from Portugal, but from uh, Spain, uh, Italy. Um, and of course, our keynote speakers, uh, Charles Valdheim from the United States and uh, from the Harvard University, and Xavier Montaix from Spain, from the Uni Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya. Um, well, I would like also to thank uh, for all the organization uh, people for uh, Maria Filipe, which is the best uh, organizer uh, in the school. Of course, for Anna, that is going to feed us or to feed the, the speakers during these days, which is also very important as we are concerning with food. Um, and also uh, to the University of Autonoma, to the administration, in the persons of, uh, of uh, Reginaldo Almeida and Cristina Dias that have helped in the financiation of this, uh, of this uh, event. And of course, also to uh, Filipe Ramalhete, that is the director of the, the research center of this school for having this research project. So uh, many thanks uh, to all. In fact, uh, these are going to be two days that are going to be very interesting for our school, of course. We have already started last week with a very uh, interesting trip to the drawing matter in the PhD of architecture with a field trip that was very interesting. So it will be very interesting to continue the PhD this week with uh, the participation in this uh, seminar. And of course, that for all the MA students, it will be a great uh, introduction or uh, continuation of the thinking on uh, food. So many thanks and many thanks to you, uh, David. It's oh. <laughs> <coughs>
Buenos días. Eh, hablaré en español, creo que todo el mundo eh, entiende sin problema porque mi inglés es criminal y, y sobre todo después de oír hablar eh, a Marta que lo habla tan, tan extraordinariamente. Eh, por supuesto, las primeras palabras son eh, de un agradecimiento muy sincero al Departamento de Arquitectura de la Universidad de, de, de Lisboa por, eh, por albergarnos, por la extraordinaria hospitalidad de que siempre hacen gala a nuestros colegas portugueses, pero en este caso eh, mucho más, y de manera muy especial eh, a Marta Sequeira, que es la organizadora perfecta, eh, este, y por supuesto a todo el personal que ha colaborado eh, a que este seminario se haga finalmente y muchas gracias también a todos los asistentes y espero que a lo largo de estos dos días que vamos a estar hablando de comida, de arquitectura y de ciudad pues eh, saquen eh, de este seminario algo que les resulte de, de interés. Este seminario tiene su origen en un proyecto de investigación que creamos en Granada del cual somos directores, mi colega David Arredondo y, y yo mismo, y que procede de nuestro grupo de investigación, del grupo de investigación que tenemos en la Escuela de Arquitectura de Granada, eh, llamado Arquitectura y Cultura Contemporánea, y eh, buscamos siempre trabajar sobre temas que sean temas transversales, temas que sean grandes temas en el debate actual, no solo arquitectónico, sino en el debate eh, urbanístico, económico, político, en el pensamiento en el contemporáneo. Y desde luego, eh, para este trabajo fronterizo en el que la arquitectura se encuentra con otras disciplinas, con otros modos de, de pensar, eh, el tema de la alimentación en su relación con la ciudad, con el territorio y con la arquitectura es un tema eh, estrella en el que se dan cita tanto el saber histórico, la historia de la cocina, la historia de la relación entre eh, la ciudad y su periferia agrícola, los flujos eh, más a larga, a larga distancia, pero también, como todos sabemos, es un problema de, de desgraciada actualidad, eh, porque actualmente todos sabemos eh, los problemas que existen de abastecimiento ecológico, medioambientales, eh, incluso médicos a nivel de, de dieta. En todo ello, la arquitectura y el urbanismo tienen mucho que decir. Sobre todo tienen mucho que decir eh, colaborando, dialogando con otros especialistas. Y este es el sentido de este proyecto de investigación que fue financiado por el Gobierno de, de España. Abrimos este, este proyecto con este encuentro en Lisboa, al que que será seguido por un nuevo encuentro en Florencia y finalmente en, en Granada. Y es un proyecto, además, en el que hemos tenido la inmensa fortuna de que eh, todos los especialistas a los que pedimos participar en él nos dijeron inmediatamente que sí. Contamos en el elenco de investigadores de este proyecto con personas que, cada uno desde su campo de investigación, ...llevan trabajando sobre este tema años y ha sido un verdadero eh, placer y una oportunidad eh, sin igual... Eh, ...poder ofrecer esta plataforma donde dialoguemos desde miradas muy distintas... ...sobre este gran problema de la, de la alimentación y la ciudad. Eh, bueno, tampoco mucho más, eh, simplemente eh, reiterar... Nuestro, nuestro agradecimiento, estamos seguros de que, de que este seminario será enormemente satisfactorio y simplemente de nuevo, pues Marta, gracias, gracias por todo, gracias a todas las personas de la Universidad de Autónoma de, de Lisboa que han colaborado a hacer realidad este evento y por nuestra parte, pues de, desearles que disfruten de estos dos días de pensar conjuntamente sobre alimentación y arquitectura. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Marta. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you all for being here, for being, you know, show this interest in, in this project that we have been developing for the last year, uh, mainly from the University of Granada in Spain, but together with 
uh, other universities in Italy and Portugal and also in Spain. Um, of course, I would like to thank my colleagues because they have been working really hard to, to have their presentation and their papers prepared to, for, for, for this seminar to share it with you all. And a very warm uh, thanks to, to Marta and all the team here in the Universidad Autónoma de Lisboa because they have made everything very easy and um, they have uh, let us work here with uh, you know, in this uh, great place. Um, everything has made very easy for us, uh, thanks to, to, to Marta. Um, yes, I, I, will, I will not like to, to speak much, but I would like on, on, only to um, talk to you about the, 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 the idea of this research project. We have been, as uh, Juan has said, uh, awarded with a, a grant for working on, on this project for four years. This is the end of the first year, and we, have, we will be working for, for another three with the colleagues in Naples, in Florence, in Madrid, and also in Granada. And this would be like the end of the first phase of our project. The, the project has three phases. The first one will be um, uh, focused on the historical problems. So in these two days, we mainly, not only, but mainly, we will talk about the eating, inhabiting, and building from the historical point of view. Uh, so that we can recognize some of the uh, historical initiatives that, that have made, put in contact all the uh, dynamics of the rural and the urban world, uh, uh, having the food as the, the main axis of this project. The next step will be um, uh, focused on contemporary projects, so we will try to study contemporary <laughs> projects, uh, living uh, housing projects that are uh, trying to find uh, initiatives that are making it in, in, in an interesting way. Um, in, it will finally uh, have a workshop in Florence also with the students. We hope to make it uh, next year. And the third phase that we conclude with a congress in Granada will have the intention to, uh, to, 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 uh, to reach to some conclusions to try to, uh, to, to change or to affect uh, political um, uh, regulations regarding to, to, to uh, housing and also to public space in which all this uh, situation will be taken into account. No? This is our, our intention, no? that all these ref reflections at the end conclude in something that can be uh, used by, by governments, by designers, by uh, institutions in order to change the relationship that we have between housing and uh, the production of food. And these three phases will be um, focused in three levels. No? We will talk about the territory, we will talk about how uh, this relation between production, consumption, also, uh, um, uh, also waste uh, management uh, is done in a uh, peri-urban or a metropolitan area. Uh, then we will have also an approach that will focus on um, on the public space, on these spaces we'll, we, we can have like a, a intermediate relation, not public but not private, so we can have this relationship with food. And um, finally the third level will be focused on, on, on the houses at home, you know, how, how kitchen and how the relationship with food is uh, all over the history influences the way we live, the, the way we uh, create our houses. So all three levels will be um, approached in these uh, three steps. Now, this is more or less the, the, the idea of our research project. We are now in the first phase and we hope that all these uh, two days will be enjoyable and interesting for you and I also invite you to participate at the end of each season uh, session for uh, to, to, if you have any question for, for, for the speakers. So thank you very much you all for, for being here. Okay, so I think we are going to, to start with the first of our keynote uh, speaker session. It will be uh, held by Charles Valheim. He uh, is um, an uh, American architect based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and working in, the, uh, in Harvard um, Graduate School of Design. Uh, he's also author, editor, and co-editor of numerous publications on topic including landscape, um, uh, urbanism, um, 
Uh, he's also a John Irving professor at the uh, Harvard University, I said that before, and he directs the school office, office for urbanization. He also serves as a Rutgers curator of landscape at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. In Boston. Um, uh, well, we have a, a very long uh, CV from, from Charles, but uh, we would like to say that uh, in, all his, uh, in addition to his uh, research, Valheim advises public and private clients also on question of contemporary urbanism and collaborates with multidisciplinary teams on urban projects all around the world. His work has been published, exhibited, and presented internationally and collaborated with architects such as Office of, for Metropolitan Architecture, Morphosis, uh, Landscape, um, James Corner Field, among others. So we are very, very glad to have uh, Charles here. He has made all the trip all from Boston, and uh, we, we are very happy to have him here. So please, Charles, whenever you want. David, thank you for that, Marta. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm sorry, I have no Portuguese. My Spanish is not going to be helpful either. Um, I'm very happy to be here among um, friends. Um, thanks to the organizers, both here um, in Lisbon and at Granada. And uh, my role is to um, get us started. So I'll try to do something that hopefully is in the spirit of the, um, of the call. Um, this topic of eating, building, inhabiting is, I believe, among the most contemporary and significant topics facing us today. Um, when I first read the call, it reminded me of the work of um, Martin Heidegger and his conception of triad of um, building, dwelling, and thinking. Um, and so in my version, I've been substituting dwelling for inhabiting. If you'd accept this, so eating, building, dwelling, I believe what's so important about the topic today is that it's perhaps the one topic I could identify that can connect the territory, the shape of the city, and the most intimate spaces of the home, and our bodies as well. And that connectivity of the topic for me is what recommends it, and it allows us to get beyond questions of purely design culture, or purely, um, you know, high status or high style, or I like blue, or maybe this is the thing that we should be um, The project that I'll share with you um, in the next couple of minutes is a research project that we've been working on for the past several years um, through my group. So this group is called the Office for Urbanization. It's a research group that sits within the Graduate School of Design. We work with cities around the world, we collaborate with partners, we hire mostly graduates of our school and other schools like ours, and then we engage in research projects addressing a variety of topics. This work is collaborative with other faculty members across the school and across the university. So I'm, I'm happy to take full responsibility for it, but it is the work that's building upon the work of many, many others. Um, uh, in this case, I want to acknowledge my colleagues in the office in our research group, Charlie Gallard, Mariano Gomez Luque, Mercedes Peralta, Minyao, Boya Zhang. What we call 50 species towns proposes a new paradigm for the development of agricultural new towns in China now. I'm happy to represent the Americas here these days. 
I'm referring to a case in East Asia, but I'm hopeful that you'll find that the topic itself is maybe relevant to your work also uh, in Europe. We're interested in an approach to heritage crops, identifying those that are the most valuable. We've identified 50 heritage crops that are associated with material culture and invaluable forms of cultural heritage. I'm sorry I don't have books for all of you. <laughs> I'm very happy to give Marta a copy. Um, but we are disseminating it and putting it in libraries and I'll be happy to share a, a copy with each of the libraries of your various schools. The research, of course, is informed by collaboration with friends in China. We work in deep, close collaboration with our colleagues in various institutions. And of course, we began the work several years ago with an interest in the ways in which every period of agricultural development in China or in East Asia or perhaps everywhere begins with a kind of imaginary. They're not simply practical effects. It's not simply historical development, but in fact, each period of agricultural development brings with it a certain image. And in the case of China, they have, they have constructed a very clear representational lens, a very clear idea that for each period, there are a different set of images appropriate. Whether this is uh, advertising real estate or uh, political propaganda, ultimately, the way that we're living in relationship to these crops uh, changes, and those changes are communicated through a variety of different uh, media. Beginning in 2016, the State Party published what was effectively its 13th five-year plan. And this five-year plan called for a reform program of agricultural modernization. These are quotes taken from that five-year plan. One of their goals has been to improve the conditions and living standards uh, throughout the country, particularly back in the villages, to develop local economies that are characteristic of local areas, to simultaneously bring industrialized agriculture to develop genetically modified crops and to do what we did in the United States in the 20th century to mechanize, to industrialize, but also use eco-friendly or ecological strategies at the same time. Another goal is to incorporate tourism to bring people out of the cities back to the villages to reintroduce a new touristic economy based on leisure uh, and, and education, to incorporate information technology as well as to integrate agricultural production into the economy while completely mechanizing the production of the major crops, wheat, rice, soy. I believe that these are imperfect measures, these are imperfect policies, but I believe they come from a place of genuine desire to address a variety of issues. Food security, simple calories, and the ability to deliver to a growing population an extraordinary uh, quantity of material. In order to do those goals, in order to accomplish those goals, the Chinese have enormous challenges having to do with water and water infrastructure, transportation, uh, water, power, you know, automobility, etc. What's actually happening in the program is that they're trying to bring agricultural work into the new economy. Following Deng Xiaoping's openings in the 1970s and 80s, as the rest of the economy has been uh, turned into a form of neoliberal capitalism, the village or agricultural economy has been the last sector that hasn't been brought into this economy. And so there's also a desire to consolidate uh, while taking pressure off of uh, the major cities. Our response to that, after many years of collaboration, has been to offer a counter proposal, acknowledging the challenges that they're facing, but to suggest that there's a real danger that these monoculture crops, wheat and corn and soy, and their industrialization, they run the risk of erasing invaluable cultural heritage. 
in much the way that we did in my country. I don't know the situation here in Portugal. I, I had a lovely meal last night, thank you. I think you guys are eating quite well here. In my culture, our heritage was erased in the 20th century in favor of an industrialized, mechanized, and genetically modified um, project. In order to support this work, we've done quite a lot of work trying to understand the demographics, internal migrations within China, demographic shifts, population tendencies, and a range of other topics that I won't go into in this context, but that I say more about in the book project. Um, we're working from the notion of what's referred to as intangible cultural heritage, and you may know that the UNESCO have very good data on this topic. They've surveyed this topic around the world, and intangible cultural heritage includes instruments, objects, cultural space, a range of things, um, including culinary uh, heritage. As of 2019, our friends in Beijing have codified uh, a range of elements that characterize Chinese intangible cultural heritage from you know, opera through musical performance and dance and a variety of other topics. Our friends in Beijing have also developed nationally important agricultural heritage systems. So they have done the research already. This is not our work. We're simply building upon the work of our friends and colleagues in China. And they've identified uh, 80 different sites around the country in which these invaluable cultural crops are being cultivated already. Our work on this topic has been informed in particular by one case study that I wanted to open with to begin with to give you a sense of what we're doing here. This is the work of uh, Dr. Kang Jiang Yu and his firm called Turinscape. Uh, Turinscape is one of the, I think, most important uh, practices of landscape architecture practicing in the world today. They're based uh, in Beijing. Uh, they had this commission uh, about 20 years ago now to develop the campus plan for a university, the Xinyang Architectural University. And my friend Kang Zhengyu was invited. He had this very important commission. And he arrived at a point when the university had hired architects and planners. They had planned the campus. And in planning the campus, they erased the local agriculture that was there. They hired architects, the best architects they could find. These architects did incredible buildings. They also spent all the money. <laughs> By the time my friend had the commission, there was no money and there was no time because it had to open now. And what Kong Zhang did was a kind of sleight of hand. It was a kind of magic trick. He said, let's just put the agriculture back. The campus that he designed is a tension between two tendencies. On the one hand, it's it initially planned as a Western-style, American-style campus with these broad alleys and these parterres and, you know, the kind of campus that you might imagine in the American or Anglo tradition. But the material that it's made out of is the wet rice farming that was erased to build the campus. Um, you can see it's intermingled with other, um, other non-human actors here as well. And there is student life. Um, what's interesting to me here is not just the economy of that, putting the displaced farmers to work on the university campus, but that the rice has now become the identity of the institution. The rice is harvested annually in a, you know, with the faculty and the students. Um, the rice is sold in the campus store. It's the mascot of the sports team, mascota. I don't know what this is in Portuguese. Mascota. So this is the, you know, the, the embodiment of the, of the institution. Now, I, I don't know how many of you want to go plant rice or farm as a part of your university studies. I don't want to make great claims about that. But this case study for me is one of the most important projects of landscape architecture in the 21st century. I believe it's underreported, it's understudied, and it's a kind of sleight of hand, right? It's a kind of Duchampian, you know, kind of trick, basically. Um, I don't know about you, I don't want to live in Newtown 47B, okay? We tried that, it didn't work, right? The first thing I was taught in architecture school was the failure of my grandparents. The failures of modernism was the first lesson we learned. Yet we continue to urbanize, we continue to grow, and particularly in China, there are great pressures, and so these new towns Agricultural new towns, these are small places of maybe 50,000 people, are a desire to take pressure off of the major and secondary cities. 
And our counter proposal to that is to identify through the most important heritage crops in China, 50 that we believe are deserving of becoming the identity of agricultural new towns. Don't worry, I'm not gonna present all 50. <laughs> So what I've had organized is a brief selection from the book. We have three examples, a kind of uh, a starter course, um, and then a couple of photographic portfolios. Um, and that's following the book's structure. Uh, the book is structured as 50 individual new town proposals uh, interspersed with photographic portfolios that I'll say more about uh, in a minute. The jujube, or the Chinese date, uh, grows in northern latitudes in a temperate, semi-arid climate. Um, the jujube fruit has been cultivated for over 3,000 years in Jia County, and those gardens contain trees that are over 1,000 years old. The jujube fruit, I'm told, has more vitamin C than the orange, more sugar than sugar cane, and yet it grows in a very arid, um, very, very, almost desert-like condition uh, on the Los Plateau. This is a material that has been deposited by wind, sand mostly. It's a very sandy soil. It's a very arid, very dry place. And yet this plant produces extraordinary uh, caloric density, incredible uh, sweetness. The jujube plant also uses its roots to consolidate soil, so the presence of the plant actually holds the earth and consolidates the ability to grow. We're interested here in the material culture, the coloration, but also the cultural uh, history that's been built around it, um, uh, you know, the, the cultivation of these jujube farms and jujube cakes produces uh, this cake feast in Jia County an annual celebration, so it's not simply the material itself, and not simply its food products, but this, you know, thousand-year-old cultural heritage. Not, this is not my heritage. I'm not Chinese. I'm not there to advise the Chinese on their history. One of the reasons why I believe that the topic that you've proposed is so important is there's nothing more personal than what we put in our bodies. There's nothing more intimate than what I was fed as a child. There's nothing more meaningful to me, irrespective of my identity as an architect, my employer, which university we're in, which book we're publishing, there's nothing more powerful than that, I believe. And I believe there's a chance that we can connect it back to a variety of other topics. So for each of the species, we're interested in the growth of the plant itself, a kind of morphological structure. How does the plant want to express itself? We're also interested in the patterns of its cultivation. Um, how are the fields structured? What does labor look like in these places? Um, what does the harvest look like materially? Because this material culture is not simply the product of an economy or an abstraction. It's deeply imbued in the coloration of the ground and the coloration of the building fabric and the coloration of, of, uh, of clothing and other things. We continued the work with what I describe as a, an admittedly perverse goal. This is a, a strange thing to do. It's a thought experiment. Would it be possible, would it be interesting, to try to answer every question about the development of a new town, a small town, 50,000 people, not from the point of view of the state, not from the point of view of the highway or the airport or the river, but from the point of view of the jujube? What would the jujube want? Now, I'm citing Kahn and Heidegger. I, as a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, I have to say, for the first time that's ever happened in my public career, um, and so each of the choices we've made are derived from the expression of the, let's call it the selfish gene of this plant species. If you follow the selfish gene argument, the notion is that these species are not our subjects. They don't work for us. They've manipulated us. The sweetness of the jujube, its persistence in this dry, arid climate, it has manipulated us into making it reproduce. Right? We're working for the jujube. So from that selfish gene point of view, our premise here is, could we answer every decision about the town? Every choice, not from the point of view of politics, society, I like blue, my uncle has some land, the airport's gonna go here, but rather from the point of view of what the jujube wants to be. Having said that, we are aware of the fact that the city has been built in a certain way over time and there is a deep history. So in each of these sites, 
we also identify what are the building structures and block structures that are traditional. And what you see here is a sample of something I'll show you a little bit more about in a minute, where we look in the region where the jujube grows, and we scan actual block structures, thousands of them, right? And then we analyze them to see, well, what is the shape of the block structure? Is there a thermal performance to this building envelope? Is there a way in which this particular cultural form has emerged? To that knowledge, we then bring an approach to Newtown development, which is based on the party plan, the 13th five year plan in 2016, as well as an understanding of various forms of density, various market understandings from single family homes, villas, almost suburban things, all the way through kind of low rise to let's call them, you know, mid rise densities. We try to derive a kind of urban or town morphology, a growth logic from the logic of the Jujube. And of course, we're, we're mindful of the Christopher Alexander notion that the city is not a tree or other ideas about that that we can talk about. And then in a kind of petri dish, on a tabletop exercise, we try to then derive urban form. What is the shape of the city? What, is, what are its spaces? What are its structures for Jujube town? What would that town be like? And then we begin to then derive from that work, well, where would the Jujube town want to be in an ideal situation? What would be the perfect latitude, solar exposure, a south facing slope on the Lopes Plateau, how much water? So again, we're trying to, again, as a thought experiment, derive these choices, not from a top-down master plan point of view, but from the species up, if that's, uh, if that's possible. Um, and I don't want to make greater claims beyond that for the outcome of these things. Um, but my point here would be for us to find an alternative way of thinking about these places um, and an alternative way of thinking about them in such uh, a manner that might allow um, us to reconcile two aspects of modernization. On the one hand, projects of modernization, agricultural modernization <coughs> otherwise, have had a tendency uh, to produce, you know, a continuation of the Enlightenment project, uh, mobility, conversations like this, you know, class mobility, education, the idea of mixing and sharing between cultures, generally held, you know, kind of Western ideals that are generally perceived to be uh, valuable. That those modernization projects have also erased cultures. They've also, you know, uh, uh, devalued and, uh, and obliterated cultures, and so. What we're interested in is trying to find a way to reconcile that tendency to erasure through modernization, but also to find local and specific identity. Uh, so as a designer coming to advise someone or have a conversation with someone, as opposed to us bringing our ideas about a new or modern approach, beginning in fact with the kind of cultural heritage that exists already. We've studied the literature on uh, agricultural town growth, uh, and it is classically Chinese divided by latitude. In the north, there is a clustered approach. In the center, there is a linear, and in the southern, there's a so-called spotted approach. So there are great depths of knowledge, uh, and if you look at the variety of cases of various new town structures that have been published, there's quite a vast literature, both in Mandarin and English, uh, I'm assuming some of that exists in Spanish and Portuguese as well. <laughs> to that, we've brought our own interests, let's say, um, which is a, a workflow in which we're trying to look at thermal performance, solar orientation and performance, and block structure to you know, pr provide a kind of um, specificity. Um, there's a portion of this work which is a reference to um, Kenneth Frampton's notion of uh, critical regionalism. Um, I don't know the status of those conversations here. In large measure, the project for a critical regionalism was a very important one for a period of time. And I think Ken, who's a friend of mine, was trying to grapple with some of the same issues. How do we resist globalization? How do we resist global culture, being local and specific? And what we found is that, you know, critical architecture is a very, you know, thin wedge against that wave. In response, what we're arguing for is a latitudinal response, that there is a kind of thermal, thermodynamic response. And in this regard, I think you know, the work of Iñaki Avalos is quite powerful in my mind, the idea of a thermodynamic model 
that can begin to render things much more specific um, in place based with respect to these um, conditions. Because you know, the nature of urban work, the nature of research, you know, the nature of these kinds of propositions can be very abstract. We've intervened every five towns with a photographic portfolio, which is to kind of cut through that and remind us of conditions on the ground, conditions in people's lives uh, in China. And I'll show you um, two of those. Um, these are both portfolios of photographs made by um, people born on the mainland in China who have immigrated to the West to be educated and then go back to China. So this kind of mirroring that's going on, different cultures between each other. This is the work of Zhao Zhao Zhu, born in Qingtian, China in 1984. Uh, Zhao Zhao has been based in the Netherlands since 1999, since going to art school there. Um, this is 2018. These are all taken in Hebei province. A girl lying on a corn pile, dead lamb. Jingming Festival 2017. And I find, you know, in the work of the best photographers or videographers, what you find is a kind of empathy, is the term that I use. There's a kind of, you know, humanity, this kind of, these are the conditions we're talking about. These are real people in real situations with, you know, their own struggles and their own aspirations, their own hopes. Um, and so the photographic portfolios for us allow us to think a little bit more deeply about the resistance of the soil or the, you know, um, the subjects for whom this work might be found to be relevant. You can see on the right hand side the structure of the book, organized uh, five species at a time, has on the right hand side a kind of encyclopedic list. Um, we've organized the book based on latitude. So having derived the ideal position vis-a-vis latitude for each of these species to express itself as a town, we work from the northern latitudes to the southern latitudes, and we have this kind of index that allows people to track through. Um, Rape seed, Brassica napus, is grown in a central latitude in a continental winter dry climate. That's DWA, for those of you that are Kopp and Geiger enthusiasts. Um, the rapeseed is primarily used in the production of canola oil in modern China, uh, but it produces this extraordinary kind of vibrant, kind of bright yellow uh, fabric. Historically, in a place like Xinhua, it's been intermixed with a kind of, um, kind of closed loop ecosystem, <coughs> including uh, fish farming or aquaculture, in which the waste products of each of those cycles have been used to fertilize the others, right? So that kind of circular economy. Um, in so-called raised field agricultural uh, systems. That kind of hybrid aquatic terrestrial food production are quite rare, even though we are now fish farming at industrial scales. The cycling of soil nutrients between the canal, decomposing organic matter, and agricultural fields um, produce incredibly productive and sustainable soil conditions over very, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Again, we're interested to derive the logic, the spatial structure, the cultivation pattern, something of the lived experience, and then to derive uh, both morphology and typology from the kind of local and specific knowledge in this place. certain measures, and Andrew and I share an interest in uh, large data sets. Um, you may know that architectural or urban typology has been an important precept in our fields for some time, and if you see here, this is a plan of one of those urban types. Uh, in this case, um, one of 18 that are found across China. What's interesting to me is in the 1980s and 90s that this was thoroughly documented. There were 18 agrarian urban types 
They were drawn perfectly, and they were drawn in the manner that you see there as a kind of idealized plan, as you can see on the right. The premise here that Witt and I are interested in is that, you know, the ideal body, think of the, you know, the Truvian man or something, the kind of idealized bodies, is maybe less interesting than actual bodies. This is a little bit of a shift from, you know, the kind of platonic ideal of physiognomy to actual populations. So what you see here is the scanning of hundreds or thousands of examples of actual courtyard houses in this region. And so this is a shift away from individual kind of idealized imagery toward, you know, something of a, of a public health approach, a kind of demographic approach. And we've done that across each of the 18 major types. And you can see here, or maybe you can, sorry, an array of a number of those, hundreds of those examples. The classical, the published version that we find in the Harvard Yanqing Library, because all this material is available in Mandarin at Harvard. And then the composite, the kind of x-ray of hundreds of them superimposed to see what the depth and breadth and, in fact, scalar differences might be. And then on the right, what we're doing is we're organizing them relative to solar orientation and latitude. Tul Morandi was born um, on the steppes in the north and west um, uh, of China um, before moving to Paris to study fine art photography, uh, where, where Tul met Bruno Morandi, uh, the architect. Uh, Tul and Bruno Morandi produced uh, this body of work. This is in Chengdu. Um, and it's a, uh, an approach to a kind of historic preservation tendency that we find these days. You may know that over the last um, decade or two, <coughs> Chinese had moved from kind of pure erasure towards something of an understanding of the maintenance of their architectural heritage. And right now, there's a very strong nexus between that notion of preservation and conservation and their culinary heritage, in this case, tea house in Chengdu, as an example. This is a part of what the Chinese party had in mind when they think of tourism. It's the kind of thing that, you know, you guys have perfected in Europe over hundreds of years, you know, terroir and the idea of champagne. What would be the appropriate thing in Portugal? I'm sorry, I, I don't know this. Uh, olive oil. Olive oil. The wine. But the trademark, you know, when I say champagne, you can't grow champagne. Port wine. Port wine, thank you very much. So the idea of taking something that was, we just made this here, it's how we do it here, and then elevating it into something of a, you could think of it as a brand on the one hand, or you might think of it as something locally specific on the other, right? So, that's a new idea in China. And the idea, instead of trying to simply import, you know, port wine from, from, from Porto or from, um, you know, uh, Champagne from France, the idea of growing their own culinary specific and destination worthy touristic, no, they're not there yet. But they're also talking about tourism within China, right? And so there's a nexus between architectural preservation uh, heritage crops, um, and again, this notion of specific cultural uh, heritage. Now, of course, you, you all will be aware that many of these crops, in this case, of certain, uh, certain kind of tea, um, have specific cultural landscapes associated with them. So the idea is once you have the species, you capture the heritage landscape, and you preserve portions of it, so you're not simply replacing it. But this you know, practice has been ongoing as a touristic activity, and at the highest levels of these brands, let's say, they are of uh, national or international uh, significance, let's say. The Tianjin pepper, Capiscum annum, grows in southern latitudes in a subtropical humid or CFA climate. It's not native to China. Uh, it's native to uh, South America, Bolivia, Paraguay. It was introduced um, in the late dynasty 14th uh, century. Uh, Mao Zedong had highly developed opinions about the tangent pepper I won't go into, um, but the idea is each one of these species has a kind of literary or poetic history to them. They're meaningful in literary terms as well as culinary uh, terms. When first introduced, the tangent pepper was primarily used for medicine or for ornament, but then ultimately these peppers became more integrated and varieties were established ultimately uh, annual pepper festivals, as you see here, uh, were developed 
in parts of China. Um, ultimately, we're interested in not only the medicinal and the, and, the, and the kind of healing capacity, but ultimately the idea that this is a very specific regional condition. And if you talk to Chinese, if you talk to mainlanders, they will tend to identify not so much through their um, linguistic origin or necessarily through their climate origin, but they'll tend to identify their, their locale based on the food that they eat. Right? We come from Chengdu, we eat a certain thing. right? Um, so we're trying to get at something quite specific and personal and meaningful even beyond a kind of national identity. And as you can see, each of the examples we're showing you, there's a kind of different morphology, a different structure, and in this case, more of a kind of seed pod-like structure. Um, a, a part of the, part of the you know, admittedly perverse interest here is that we seem to have withdrawn, at least in, in our culture, I don't know the situation here, we've withdrawn from questions of urban form. You know, we've been interested in you know, landscape urbanism for some time, we've been interested in ecological performance, social engagement, and there's a real danger, I believe, that we lose the capacity or the appetite for actually pro proposing, here's the structure of the city. And I think that's a, a failure on our part, broadly speaking, uh, primarily coming from the export of my culture. More about that. Maybe, uh, um, and in the context of, especially neoliberal economies, you know, advanced capitalism, it's been very difficult to find examples in which the state or uh, various actors have the, um, have the, yeah, the stomach for making these kinds of you know, spatial choices. And yet the question of organization persists. And I would like to imagine that it's not simply a continuation of the kind of efficiency of the modern project, nor is it simply, well, capital will have its way, but we might think of some of these places as spaces of resistance or at least friction to the kind of un, uh, un, unrestricted um, so what I want to leave you with is the idea of, above all, a kind of an approach to design research which is speculative, which is propositional, uh, but by being speculative and propositional, that does not mean that it is silly, right? It's not simply, you know, a, a, a wish fulfillment or a desire. It's in fact rooted in, in a deep and specific form or forms of knowledge, um, and in which I believe we might be able to, through this lens of, you know, eating and building and dwelling, um, be able to propose alternative and better futures for all of us. So thank you all very much.
For example, I think saffron was also used for like ritual practices. But I yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, I come here for Team Blue. I know it on the screen, I know it looks black, but it's blue collar, a working class, you know? Um, so I think these things matter, you know? And, and my friend Kong John, when he goes on the road, he's always wearing the Chinese red, always, because it's you know, party colors, right? Um, and I think, on the one hand, it's true that these things are powerful and meaningful, and it's a question of causality that I find interesting. That is, does the fact that red, you know, become very powerful through culinary experience lead us to thinking of the nation as red? Or did the nation as red come first? That kind of tribal, I've got a flag, you've got a flag, you know. I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. What I can tell you is that the question of color is not a secondary issue. It's not, that's one of the reasons I like the topic is it's embedded in the materiality. It's in us. We ingest it. And all you need to do is to see the color of the food that you're eating to understand that. And there's something, it, it's been you know, edified in those festivals. I mean, they don't wear that dress all, all the time. Every Tuesday, they're not dressed up in these great things. So I think it's part of ritual. But it becomes imbued in the material fabric of the terrace, the territory, but also the building fabric. You know, so it's a part of that. Logistics. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll be thinking about that on the Everything was a risk. The diversity of all of the immigration, all of the indigenous, you know, 
The most important new Michelin star restaurant in the United States is in Minnesota, and it serves a kind of, it's an indigenous chef that does kind of indigenous cuisine with wild rice and game, and that's the future, and we've lost that history. We've lost it, we've erased it. And as the Chinese you know, were briefing me in 2017, 2018 on their plans to go to Manitoba and to go to the Netherlands, thank you very much, and get all the new stuff, I just, I just, I turned white. You, know? I'm just, you have to understand that this is a problem, and luckily in Europe, I think in Naples, you understood this sooner, so hopefully there's less loss. Um, but I think these things are always uh, fraught. On the first question of color, I was on the beach last year in Massachusetts with my family. And I, I don't go to the beach much, but we go in August, and it's a nice thing. And I happened to have on a baseball cap of the local sports team, the Red Sox. The hat was red. My friend, Jim Corner, who's also going to the beach, I see him, hey, Jim, I haven't seen you. He's like, you're wearing a Republican hat. This is a MAGA hat. I'm like, no, this is the, we can't give away the entire color red to the other side. I'm sorry. And I understand that these things are changing over time. Historically, but I, you know, I want to be able to cut my hair this way and not be confused with the fascist. You know, like I, like I, I don't believe the color red should be given over to an entire political spectrum and abandoned. That we cannot give that up. So I, I agree. These colors they change their meaning. It's always contested and it's really, really interesting. Thank you. Hi, Jim. It's been very well received. Um, 
This was all planned, of course, pre-COVID, so we haven't been able to be with our team on the ground. But of course, we have books and we have colleagues and friends that we're doing a lot of virtual talks and virtual book launches. Um, and it's an open question whether East Asia is going to open again in the same way. You know, um, so I think the, the short answer is you know to 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 be determined. Stay tuned. Okay, so I think we can uh, close here. Uh, thank you very much, Charles, for your uh, for sharing your work with us, for your explanation. As I told you yesterday, your work has been very inspiring for me from uh, my uh, research in the last 10 years I hope. And now that the, uh, the colleagues and the students here know your work, it will also be inspiring for, the, for them. And we are looking forward to see, to see your book. So uh, I think we are going to close for a little bit and we will be back at 11 o'clock. Thank you.